Gerald, thank you very much for doing this today. Really appreciate you taking time out of your, uh, your busy workday. And today I want to talk to you about your hashtag climate brawl. So what in the world uh, uh, motivated you to uh, engage climate deniers this aggressively? Well, I've been engaging with climate deniers for the last couple of years on Twitter. And what happened, it, it develops with time. You start developing your own style <clears throat> technique. And oh, I guess about eight, 10 months ago, I was dealing with a high profile climate denier. And these guys know how to play the game. And uh, I was still learning. I was getting better at it, of course, because it is a little bit of a, a, a verbal game as you're going along. But then all his followers jumped in. And I was just swarmed. Like it, once you get in there, even though it's just Twitter and you can walk away, you feel trapped. And I had like 10,000 engagements over, over a day from this one high profile climate denier. And I thought, this isn't fun. Well, why don't I have a whole pile of my followers joining in? And I thought about it some more and I said, well, I'm going to invent a hashtag. Never even tried before in my life. You know, they usually go nowhere. I even forget how I came up with Climate Brawl. I checked to make sure it wasn't widely used and that it sort of described why I felt I was involved in. Well, for reasons that I really don't know, it took off. And as with all hashtags, it developed its own, its own definition. And so what started off, it meant that, hey, I'm, I'm challenging some climate deniers on the science can somebody jump in and help me here because this guy's really good or he's got 10 followers that are helping him or whatever the case may be. What it means today though, is the mobilization of a community on Twitter to encourage them to combat the challenges of the propaganda of climate deniers. And that's really cool because like you said, you, 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 you see my tweets, you find me quite aggressive against the climate deniers. A lot of people want to be, but the infamous silent majority is the silent majority. And in my opinion, anyway, Climate Brawl has brought some of those people out to really show what the Twitterverse really thinks about the propaganda of climate deniers. Well, look, I've got a question for you here. Our mutual acquaintance, Professor Monica Gattinger from the University of Ottawa, I interviewed her here on, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the polarization of the energy and climate discussion in Canada. So we've got these, the climate deniers on one side, the climate uh, change proponents uh, or supporters on the other side. And she was arguing that we need kind of a middle ground, you know, where we can meet and come up with some solutions and, you know, be more pragmatic. And the polarization uh, uh, works against that. And I'm not so sure that I agree with that anymore. It really is a climate brawl. And maybe it is that the climate deniers just need to be defeated. What's your take on that? Uh, I attended one of their, their uh, lectures on positive energy. It was interesting and I thought well organized. I think the intent is good. Boy, it's pretty hard to pull off. Look, from my point of view, and I think from a lot of people's point of view, science is science. And so that's the starting point. That's not the place to be debating about. There's no doubt about the science of climate change. The climate experts are clear on that. And certainly when it comes to the, let's say, the economic uh, effect of any policies on the oil and gas industries, that, that's one thing. But I'm certainly, I don't think most people are interested in discussing the merits of the science. That's done by the experts within the science. There's no merit to discuss. Abacus Data has got a lot of really interesting polling information from their surveys over the last three or four years on what Canadians think about uh, climate change and climate science. And the, while there are quite a number of people on the supportive side, uh, actually probably 50% or more, uh, there's a significant percentage in the climate laggard, and I don't think I have to describe that term uh, or explain that term very much. It's 11% nationally and 29% in Alberta, which is really quite remarkable when you think about it. And is the, are those the folks that you're 
doing battle with in the climate brawl hashtag? Probably. I, I follow the polls quite closely, including Abacus on the on climate change. I follow it in the U.S. as well. The stats are somewhat different, but you still have similar sort of numbers. I've been told, and I think this is true, if you take any theory, you'll find that somewhere between 15 and 30 percent of the population believe it. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, they joke about flat earth, you know, conspiracies about 9-11. It doesn't matter. You've got Loch Ness Monster. You can go through uh, Area 51. So you're always going to have part of the population that doesn't matter what it is. And those aren't really the concern. And uh, on Twitter, we talk about the hardcore climate deniers. And these are guys that are, well, outrageous as far as I'm concerned, but you're never going to convince them. And I often get asked, well, why am I bothering communicating with them on Twitter? I'm not going to convert them. There's two major reasons for that. The problem with propaganda, and propaganda is a serious issue. I hate to know the name fake news. It's propaganda, and propaganda is, is something that's evil. And when you repeat propaganda over and over again, some people start to believe it's the truth. Sure. And I don't want that to happen. Second of all, the people that I'm really trying to influence are their fo followers and others on in the Twitterverse that may be watching. That's a very interesting point because I often uh, make the same argument myself. Uh, in this context, I don't know if you remember George Bernard Shaw's famous dictum about uh, don't wrestle with pigs because uh, <laughs> all you do is get dirty and the pigs enjoy it. Yep. And I, I, have, I did a little experiment a year or so ago where I actually deliberately wrestled with pigs, and it's really true. Uh, <laughs> there's no question that you do get dirty, and I, I had to change my, my own strategy and tactics because I was behaving on social media in ways that I didn't like, my, re my readers and followers didn't like. And so I learned from that lesson. But it's still true, I think, that the reason you engage somebody with which whom you will never ever convince otherwise is because you're not doing it to convince them you're doing it to convince the people who are watching the debate and and i, I very often i get people saying to me you know i watch you on twitter uh, i don't join in because you know i don't want to get involved and it's messy and all that kind of stuff but i watch you and that influenced me the way i thought and i think there's a lot more of that goes on than we are maybe aware of or acknowledge What's your take? Generally, I, I agree with what you're saying. First of all, the one thing that's come up on climate brawl that's related to this is that, well, gee whiz, climate brawl. You're, 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 you're trying to entice violence or something like that. It, it's not true. And we're not trying to get down and get dirty with the pigs. Uh, the one thing that I often, when I treat, tweet about climate brawl, I often add a three words at the end. And those words are be active, civil, and factual. And I use that all the time because when you're in these battles and they get real nasty at times, some people are unbelievably crude and rude and simply nasty and hurtful. I believe that I never go down to their level. And it's hard not to, but I think you lose your message when you do that. And by trying to take a little bit of a higher ground, which I hope I'm doing, I believe I am, the message comes across even stronger when people do come back against you and it is simply not the right way to talk to anybody at any time. The problem with Twitter, it gives people somehow this freedom that they can do anything they want. And a lot of the, you see a lot of people on Twitter that are anonymous. Well, a lot of the hardcore climate deniers I deal with, there's real good reasons why they're anonymous, because there's no way they want their family and friends to ever see what they're doing on Twitter. What, now, talking about fake news, one of the things that we've come to learn is how active uh, states like Russia are in spreading misinformation in, around the North American uh, Twitterverse and social media sphere. And are you running into any of that? I mean, do you ever see it where you, you know it's a bot or you know it's a troll that could be Russian or some other places that is uh, deliberately trying to inflame the discussion? And just on a side note, for anyone that's really interested in that, I strongly recommend they watch The Great Hack. It's, it's on Netflix, for example. It is scary what groups like that can do 
on democratic societies. It, it was actually scary. Now, talking about regular bots and stuff, they're really hard to identify on Twitter. There's guys that look like bots and aren't. There's, you know, and there's these little programs that people put their names in. Uh, I certainly am seeing that more and more. Usually what gives them away is they're incoherent how they respond to some tweets. And it doesn't even make any sense what they're saying. And that's a sure sign that something's going on. So in the people that, that follow me, a lot of them are climate deniers. And they're just waiting to pounce on something I have. I, I know that I have dozens of bots that are following me and are uh, interacting with me. But to be sure which ones are, it's hard to say. Now, where they're coming from, whether they're Russian or, they're, or from the denial machine in the U.S., I really don't know. And to a certain extent, it doesn't matter. But when we come back to my earlier point, when I'm talking about the propaganda, that I, I, I have to challenge it. It doesn't matter if it's coming from a bot or some coming from some oil worker in in the prairies. Now, this is very interesting because uh, you're trying to convince either the client, the people you're debating, their followers or the silent majority. Do you find that the actual science or data or evidence is important or is it making some kind of a an, an argument or a plea that that connects with people emotionally in your experience what do you find is is most effective when i was going through my transitions of evolving on twitter which everyone does one of the first things i i was doing it was called climate change is science not opinion because people are often making a statement and then i give a quote from nasa or from noaa or from Dr. Man, or something like that. And I think that's effective. The problem is science doesn't do that well on Twitter. It is, it's a little bit hard to explain. And by the way, I'm not a climate expert. I don't claim to be. I claim to believe in the science of anthropogenic global warming, but that doesn't make me a scientist. And there's right. some I, very... I, want I want to interject in here. Uh, you are a chemical engineer, correct? A, a chemist. I'm a PhD chemist. There we and go. I, okay, so you do have some expertise. Oh yes, and I've I've written a book on the politics of climate change, so I I I, I know what's going on. But if people really want to hear about the science of climate change, two of the top Twitter climate scientists are Dr. Mann and Dr. Hayhoe. They are very active on Twitter and do a very good job. And so I what I don't like to do is start debating something where I really don't know the subject matter perfectly. I don't want to pretend, I don't want to play games with these guys. But to more directly answer your question, climate deniers often quote so-called science. So what do you do when that happens? I found on Twitter the standard way of doing that was to give what the real science was. Quoting a NASA or quoting a peer-reviewed paper from a climate expert. But I, I choose a different tact. I say, you prove to me that your claim is science. Well, that has changed the game, I think, a lot on Twitter. And how do you do that? Uh, how do you prove you have science? You have to quote a peer-reviewed study. There are some that support a little bit climate denialism. There are very few. There are thousands that support anthropogenic global warming. And so you put the onus on, on the guy making the claim. They're the ones that are making the false statements. You show me you're right. My my approach to this, because I actually don't know the science, uh, my approach has been to say, look, I also don't know the science behind vaccines, for instance. But a few years ago, when the anti-vaxxers were active, I interviewed Dr. Glenn Armstrong, who's the chief virologist at the University of Calgary. I had him explain the science to me over the course of 30 minutes or 45 minutes, explain some of the objections and so on that the anti-vaxxers made. And I said, that's it. I don't need to know any more science. I have, I understand now that science, the science is proven, it's settled. And I've taken the same approach with the climate deniers. It doesn't really work that well, frankly. And I think your approach actually would probably work a little better. Do you find that it has been effective to do that? The one thing that's very difficult for everybody is how well a job are you actually doing on Twitter? Uh, 
some high profile climate deniers, they just block me. And that's a little bit of a victory that, you know, that they can't stand up to what I believe is the truth. And so they, they, they simply block and put me out of the misery. I don't block or mute anyone, by the way. I'm very strange that way. I get criticized for that all the time. You were mentioning these bots before. Well, why don't I block a, a bot? Well, it's because I can't see what they're doing. I, I can't challenge what they're doing. Make, pretending they're not there doesn't work. Uh, I do find that I focus again on high profile climate deniers where, where I can. Some of the big guys. And a few have blocked me, as I stated, and the other ones ignore me lots of times. And I find that's a little bit of a victory there because these guys know how to play the game on their side. And they are not too keen to engage with me very often. Who are some of the people that you would engage with uh, who are reluctant or even people that you actually do actively engage with, climate deniers, high profile climate deniers, any names that we might recognize? Uh, Steve Malloy is a is a very top one. Uh, Tom Nelson, he blocked me. Uh, uh, Patrick Moore, who's well known in Canada, uh, he's blocked me. Friends of Science in Calgary, they've blocked me. Uh, um, Tom Harris in Ottawa, uh, he's another one I, I engage on a regular basis. Uh, oh, and now that's interesting because Tom Harris, of course. I don't know if he's still associated with Friends of Science, but certainly was for, for a long time. And he still engages with you? He, he doesn't. I engage with him. Ah. Uh, and the, the last one I just wanted to mention, because he's fairly well-known Canadian, is, is Brett Wilson. Of yes. Uh, followers of my Twitter account will know that Brett and I have had many tete-a-tetes uh over the the years uh, actually uh, not on climate denial uh, uh per se but uh, other energy policy uh, and issues but that's grist for another interview uh gerald thank you very much for this uh, i really appreciate it any final thoughts on climate brawling and how to engage with climate deniers the one thing i really try to push is on the silent majority on twitter is actually helping the climate deniers and so I try to encourage everyone to do two things, actually engage like I do and others. We call them the friends of climate brawl. But some people feel very uncomfortable with that. And I understand that. It's, it's not easy to do this sort of thing. The other way is simply to support the ones that are doing the climate brawls, sure. challenging the climate deniers. Retweet them, like them, tell them that you like what they're doing. And that's all it takes. And more and more people, I think, are doing that. So hopefully we are making a difference. Well, thank you much, very much for joining us today. And I have no doubt that we will be talking again in the future. Our real pleasure, Markham. Thank you so much.